We're continuing our series in First Things First and uh, looking again at things that are new. And I'd like for you to open your Bible today to the ninth chapter of Acts, verse 11 and following. We'll be walking through that scripture in just a moment. Today we're focusing on our walk in Christ as the, one of the things that is new when we become a believer. Years ago, Watchman Nee wrote a very helpful little book called Sit, Walk, Stand. It was a small commentary on the book of Ephesians in which he rightfully divided Ephesians into three parts. The first three chapters emphasizing our position in Christ that we are seated with him. The Christian life does not begin with a call to do anything. It, becomes, it begins with a call to rest in what Christ has done. When you sit on a chair, you place all your weight on the chair. And when you come to Christ, you place all your weight upon him. That is why in looking at the things that are new, we've started off in the last two weeks by looking at what Christ has done for us. He has given us a new nature. He has written our name in the book of life. And he has justified us by his grace through our faith. When we have learned to sit, then we're called to walk. And uh, as we walk, Ephesians 4, 5, and the first half of chapter 6 emphasize what we do, but we only do when we've learned to be. And then Watchman Nee says we go on to stand, that is, we engage in spiritual warfare. Since we have rested and totally relied upon Jesus for our salvation, and he completely supports us, now we're called upon to walk as a Christian. But what steps do I take as a Christian? And what is my responsibility and my part in bringing about and facilitating growth as a believer? I found this week in looking again at the conversion of Saul and Tarsus that there are eight steps that he took which become examples for us in walking with Christ. And I want to share each of those points briefly with you because if you are new in Christ, you need to be following these steps. And if you have been in Christ for some time, but hear what I'm saying today and have begun to drift away from any of these steps, you need to get back to them. And you need to repattern yourself after what it means to walk with Christ. The first thing that we find Paul doing after his encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus, the first thing we find him doing is praying. Verse 11, the Lord told Ananias, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. You will never build a strong Christian walk without prayer. Paul had some advantages in prayer that you may not have. He was a Jewish rabbi by all accounts. And that meant that he was familiar with the forms of prayer. He was familiar with the idea of prayer. He was familiar with the liturgy of prayer. So he had a, a method for praying. You may not have a method for praying. You may be like the disciples uh, who come to the Lord after being with him for a whole year and say, Lord, we don't know how to pray. Teach us how to pray. And perhaps you need to hear the Lord say to you what he said to those disciples. Here's a little minute prayer. Pray it. And as you pray that minute prayer, it'll expand on you. It'll become the outline for what you're doing. Jesus really in the Lord's Prayer taught them to pray for God's concerns and for their concerns. And with God's concerns, his concern was that his name be hallowed or reverence, that his kingdom come and that his will be done. For their concerns, he taught them to pray for daily needs, for forgiveness, and for security. Save us, deliver us from temptation. And, and beginning with that minute prayer, Gradually, they learn to become people of prayer as they pray it. Ultimately, we find, for example, Paul telling us that he prays without ceasing. That's the epitome of effective praying. Is, and it's not praying without ceasing, by the way. It doesn't mean praying every moment. The word in the Greek was used of a person that had a hacking cough. It didn't mean that the cough was occurring every moment. It meant that the cough kept interrupting the routine. You never knew when it was going to break out. And that's the way with Paul's praying. He's, that's an advanced state of prayer, but you've got to begin somewhere in praying. And so begin with the Lord's Prayer, or maybe a little acrostic that I heard when, when I was a new Christian. has been a great help to me in praying. It simply is ACTS, A-C-T-S. Begin prayer with A for adoration. Simply adore God. Go on to C, to confession. Bring to God your failures and your needs. Go to T for thanksgiving, and then go to S for supplication. 
So many times praying becomes a laundry list of needs where we sort of go through a check line item list. And we're in those kinds of prayers it can get boring very quickly because we're sort of saying, God do this, God do this, God do that. However, when you read the prayers of Paul, especially in Ephesians 1 and 3, you'll find that prayer basically is fellowship with God. It's, uh, it's more than simply giving him a laundry list of needs. It is communing with him. It is asking for him to do an inner work on us and not just to rearrange some furniture in the, in the arena of life. But pray. Don't read books on prayer necessarily. Don't even, you don't even need to learn uh, to listen to many sermons on prayer. The most effective way to pray is just pray. It's like swimming. Uh, you'll learn to swim effectively if you swim. If you don't swim, you can read all the books in the world. It won't do you a bit of good. You get in the water and try it. And praying gives us that opportunity to listen to God. Set aside a specific amount of time, or a, a, a reasonable amount of time, a, a, an, a, an amount you can achieve. Don't begin as a new Christian by saying, I'm going to start by praying an hour and a half a day. You probably won't hit that unless you're in an intensive time of prayer like Paul was in his early days. But set something that's realistic. Stick with it and learn to listen to God. Maybe keep a journal. Write down what you're praying for. Write down how God is speaking to you in prayer. What impressions are coming on your heart. As you write that down, you can begin to test out what God's voice is, how you can learn to listen to God in prayer, and how that can be tested with experience so you can begin to discern between your imagination and the voice of God. But pray at all, at, for whatever. However you do it, pray. Because prayer puts us into communion with eternal God and brings us into fellowship with Him in a very powerful way. Nothing will ever substitute for prayer. The second step that Paul took is that uh, hands were laid upon him that he might be filled with the Spirit, Acts 9, 17. Ananias entered the house, placing his hands on Saul. He said, Brother Saul, the Lord, Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you might see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Paul had already been converted. He'd been converted three days earlier, and we know from the Scriptures that when you're converted, the Holy Spirit takes up residence in your life. So the Holy Spirit was already in Saul. But Saul needed a subsequent experience with the, with the, with the Holy Spirit, such as the disciples had had on the day of Pentecost, such as Cornelius had in Acts 10, such as John's disciples had in Acts chapter 19, an empowerment of the Spirit. And it's a wonderful thing the early church had when a convert newly came in. They practiced the laying out of hands that they might receive the Spirit and be empowered in a special measure in their life. We need the power of the Holy Spirit to successfully live the Christian life. The third step that Paul took as a new believer was that he was baptized, verse 18. He got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Baptism. Dr. J. Edwin Orr was with us several years ago and preached a sermon I will remember uh, uh, forever. It was one of the greatest sermons I've ever heard, and it was simply entitled, The First Word of the Gospel. He took as his opening illustration the fact that the alphabet begins with the letter A. Why does it begin with A? Because it begins with A. That's where A is, and A starts it, and that's the way it is. And he said, when you look at the gospel of Jesus Christ, if you were looking for the first word, what would you expect the first word of the gospel to be? And he went through John the Baptist preaching, through Jesus preaching, through Peter's preaching on the day of Pentecost, through the apostles' preaching, through Paul's preaching, and showed time and time again where the first word is the word repent. That's the first word of the gospel. Change your mind. Change your way. Change your outlook. Make a, an about face. Turn direction. I would say then that the second word of the, if the first word of the gospel is repent, the second word of the gospel is be baptized. And it becomes the third step here that Paul took after praying, after being filled with the Spirit, he was baptized in water. Sometimes the second and third steps get a little reversed, but be baptized. Sometimes the person will say, well, I'm not sure yet that I'm worthy to be baptized. Uh, if you've become a Christian, God has already made you worthy. You need to be baptized in water. No one would ever think of entering an army and starting off the first order that was given, standing order by the commander in chief, in chief, deliberately disobeying that order. You may not understand all the reasons for the order, but if the order is there as a new member of the army, you obey it. The sovereign Lord of the universe says to us upon our confession of him as Lord, now I want you to be baptized. Be baptized. It's an order. It's not a wish. It's an order. The baptism, of course, expresses our identification with his death and with his resurrection. It expresses the fact that we've been cleansed from sin. It expresses our public stand with him. But he says, be baptized. And uh, 
Don't try to live the Christian life by being disobedient in a clear area where the Lord is telling you to do something. Be baptized. Paul was baptized. Baptism was immediate. It, it, the apostles did not put people on probation and said, we're going to look at you again in a year or two and see if you're worthwhile baptizing. It was be, be, repent and be baptized. And that's the order with us as well. The fourth step that Paul took upon becoming a believer is that he joined himself to the disciples. Saul, verse 19, spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. And again, we find when he came to Jerusalem, verse 26, when he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples. Paul understood that in coming to Christ, he'd also come to the people whom the Lord had already gathered. He had come to the church. There's no such thing as a solitary Christian life, unless you had the misfortune to be placed in solitary confinement because of your faith in Christ, which nobody in this country has been placed in. We are called to serve him in fellowship with others. We need the encouragement, the strength, the support, and the involvement of the church, the body of Christ, in our lives. We need other believers. If I don't have other believers, I will become excessively puffed up or excessively discouraged. But I need other people to straighten me out when I need straightened out and to encourage me when I'm down, to live the life of Christ together. So Paul found the church in the place he lived, and he became attached to it. There are too many believers in Southern California culture that are attempting to be tumbleweed Christians or television Christians. Television can be an augment to spiritual life, but it will be a hindrance if a person become attached, becomes attached to a machine and substitutes that for the body of Christ. It was never meant to be a substitute for the body of Christ. And if you're floating from place to place following speakers, that's not God's will for your life. I say that unequivocally. I will say it here or any place in this whole world where I, talk, where I might have occasion to talk with Christians. It's not a plug for Newport Mesa Christian Center. It's the gospel truth. You need to be plugged into a local body. And you will never grow if you float. You will only grow when you, take, when you get roots down in the soil and you begin associations with people and take on responsibility within the sphere of responsibility that that local body has to reach its community. And your growth spiritually is going to suffer if you do not have a firm commitment to the local church. You need to be regular in attendance at worship services. You need to reevaluate recreation priorities in order to do this. You need to be faithfully involved because it is as you're involved and as you take responsibility that growth most readily comes. The Lord loves the church, and he wants us to love the church as well, his body, his people. The fifth uh, step in growth that Paul took was that he made it immediately, he made a public stand for Christ. Acts chapter 9, verse 20, at once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. Like Paul, when we become a Christian, we need to announce it. People around us need to know that the change has taken place. We need to say it because we need to hear it and they need to hear it. I've taken my stand for the Lord. It's very interesting to compare verse 20 of Acts 9 with verse 22. At the beginning, he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God, and a little short time later, he was proving that Jesus is the Christ. I think there's a difference between saying that Jesus is the Christ and proving that he is the Christ. Some days time elapsed between those two. Fascinating to watch when the 12 were sent out by Jesus on their first training mission. He sent them out and he said, now, when you go, tell, tell what's happened to you. Tell the good news of the kingdom. But if anybody won't receive you, he says, uh, shake the dust off your feet and leave the place. He tells them basically, don't get into a discussion with anybody. Don't get into an argument with anybody. Just go on. Move on. Tell your testimony. Move on if they won't receive you. And yet when you come to Paul in the book of Acts, you find him as a rabbi discoursing and arguing in the synagogue, proving that Jesus is the Son of God. The difference is simply this, that in the beginning of the walk of the disciples with Jesus, they didn't know enough to enter into a reasonable discourse with anybody to give a reason for the hope that was in them. They just knew that what a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. So all we know is our testimony. So we tell that if a person won't receive it, and we walk on. If you're a freshman in a, in a university class and your professor is a, is a, is a Christian-hating prof, you're not going to at that moment intellectually argue him into the Christian faith. You won't be able to do it. Give yourself four years of college and, and three graduate years of theological study, and you'll come back and, and uh, reduce his arguments to cinder, you know, but you're not ready at that moment. You simply say, Jesus came into my life. He's put my life together. He delivered me, or he did this, stuff for, or did that. But the testimony and move on. And that's all that the Lord is asking us. You will know more non-Christians in the early stages of your discipleship probably than any other time in your Christian walk. The average 
Christian knows more non-Christians in the first year of their, of their Christianity than they do 10, 15 years down the road. Why? Because over a period of time you get a lot of Christian friends. But right now you have a lot of non-Christian friends. And they need to know. You need to tell them. Declare it. Declare that you belong to the Lord. Two weeks ago, I was talking with a businessman who does not attend our church, a Christian businessman, and he was relating to me some of the problems he had doing business with Christians. How disappointed he was over the contracts that had been broken and bills that were unpaid and the unchristlike spirit he had seen in businessmen naming the name of Christ. Such ought not to be. When we declare that we are Christian, we ought to live it with our lifestyle as well as, well as our words. Words are no good. They're not backed up by actions that declare there's something different about us. We belong to Christ. We're committed to his lordship. It's one thing to call Jesus Savior. It's another thing to call him Lord. If we're going to be an effective Christian, we're going to need to name him as Lord. A sixth step in Christian growth comes as we encounter adversity. Acts chapter 9, verses 23 to 25. After many days had gone by, the Jews conspired to kill him. But Saul learned of their plan. Day and night they kept close watch on the city gates in order to kill him. But his followers took him by night and lowered him in a basket through an opening in the wall. Paul's first adversity. Some people hadn't received his testimony. They launch a campaign to get him, to rub him out. And while he might have asked, Lord, I don't understand this mystery. On the road to Damascus, you appear to me with blinding light and blind me. Why can't you from now on blind all my opposition? But there's this strange paradox in God is that sometimes we see his power in a marvelous way and other times he appears to withdraw that power. And we're left in kind of a wilderness experience. Thank God, by the way, that the basket weaver at, uh, this, at, at, uh, at Damascus took seriously his trade. If he'd have made a weak basket, we'd have lost an apostle to the church. And so whatever you're doing, do it all for the glory of God. Even if it's weaving a basket, it may be used to hold the future leader of the church. You know, do it well. So he'd done his work well. But Paul learned right off the bat that there was going to be adversity in his Christian experience. And you read 2 Corinthians, and you'll find him experiencing a lot of adversity. But if you're anything like me, you'll discover that you grow best in adversity. And that uh, and no one asks for it. You know, that's not the kind of thing where you go out looking for it. But when it occurs, it's a real occasion to sink your teeth in and go for it. We as Christians know something called the wilderness experience like Jesus had in the wilderness. The time when we appear to be vulnerable, when it almost seems that God has abandoned us and the devil has been given access to it, to us. But when we trust the Lord completely in those times, he puts power and strength in our life. We go through them those kinds of times and we say, I'd never do it again, but I wouldn't trade it either. Learn to trust God in the adverse times. That's an important step in the development of a Christian walk. Don't drop out. Don't be a dropout at that point when adversity hits. It's going to hit. The devil's going to hit you if you've got a firm commitment to Jesus Christ. And every major step you take in your experience as a Christian, every major step forward in faith, you are going to get hit. Just know it's going to happen. Everything we've done as a church in the last five years as we have moved ahead into an unprecedented time of development and growth in the body, as a leader, I have got it hit on the head. I've been quiet about it. I haven't talked about it. And we've had a wonderful congregation to work with, so it hasn't been problems within the church. But just things that the devil has wanted to decimate me with in terms of my faith and my, my confidence and the like and, and powerful slugs from the enemy. But it's like a 15-round punching match. And uh, we're going to emerge uh, with a TKO in the last round. Uh, only he's, the Lord is going to step into the ring and he's going to administer it just before you know, we... Uh, well, I'll go on from there. But uh, so what's going to happen? We need to trust God in our adverse times. Trust Him completely. A seventh step of growth for Paul came as he was absorbed in the Word of God. And we don't find that particular reference in Acts 9, but we do know by cross-referencing Galatians 1 with Acts chapter 9 that there was a time in here in the moments when Paul was going back and forth from Damascus to Jerusalem, there was a time span of three years that he slipped away and went to Arabia, perhaps modern Saudi Arabia, somewhere in the Arabian Peninsula. He slipped away to Arabia, and he drops out of sight. What I personally feel Paul was doing in that time was taking those three years to integrate his Christian experience with, his, with where, where he'd been as a Jewish rabbi. He's taking time to re-examine the Word. It was his own personal seminary, if you will, his own personal encounter with the Word of God and the Spirit of God where he, where, he, where he came to get his grasp of Scripture that he would use so powerfully. Someone has said that when Paul went into the desert, the Arabian desert, he took with him in his knapsack Psalms, the Law, and, uh, and the Prophets. That's what he had in his knapsack. But when he emerged three years later, he had Galatians, Ephesians, and Romans in his heart and on his lips. 
He went through the metamorphosis, and we need to get the Word into us. We need to take daily time, a re, uh, again, achievable time, uh, five minutes, ten minutes, fifty minutes. If you're a new Christian, start with the Gospel. Start with the Gospel of Mark or the Gospel of John. Read it and reread it. Soak yourself, saturate yourself in the Gospels in the New Testament. Learn, just learn to read and enjoy the Scripture and let it speak to you. Keep a notebook, jot things down, impressions you have. Ask questions. Is there an example here for me to follow? Is there a command for me to obey? Is there an error that I'm to avoid? A sin that I'm to forsake? A promise that God wants me to claim? A new insight into God. Ask yourself as you study the Word and let it speak to you. The eighth step in the development of Paul's Christian growth was his faithfulness to serve God in an unnoticed place. After escaping danger in Damascus and Jerusalem, Paul went to Tarsus, where he remained until Barnabas summoned him, Acts chapter 11, verses 25 and 26. We don't know what he was doing in Tarsus. Perhaps he was making tents, perhaps he was ministering in a, some obscure place, perhaps to a small band of Christians that began to gather. But whatever he was doing, he had been faithful at it. Barnabas knew that and went and got him. He had been in an unnoticed place. And after serving effectively in an unnoticed place, the Lord gave him more responsibility. Jesus says in Mark 4, 25, to him who has, more will be given. He's not really talking about economics at that point. He's talking about methodology and education. He's saying if you want to learn to play the piano, then you've got to keep playing the piano. Because if to him who has more will be given. If you're like me, if you quit playing the piano after be, having been given a few lessons, you'll forget where H and J is on the piano. It just won't even be around anymore. <laughs> I mean, the only thing I can do now on a piano is play Rock of Ages with two fingers. But I used to do more than that. But what I had was taken away from me because I didn't use it. Wasn't faithful at, at the practice. Same way with the foreign language. Same way with the Christian life. You need to have a place of commitment, a place where you know you're counted on, uh, an opportunity of service uh, uh, somewhere, maybe obscure as all get out, maybe seemingly unimportant, but some way you can serve. If it's, if it's even a place of intercessory prayer, perhaps you can't do things for others, but it can be a place where you take upon yourself some burden, some commitment to meet some need through prayer. It's okay, but have a place of commitment and be faithful at it. Assuming responsibility is vital to Christian growth. I make it my goal to always have some responsibility that is just a little bit beyond my, native, my natural ability because I need to be in slightly over my head so I can learn to trust God and depend upon Him and grow in faith. And if I'm just doing what I can do, then I'm not growing because I'm, I've, I've stopped. I'm just doing what I can do. But if I will ask God, Lord, don't give me an ocean to get lost in, but just give me more than I have so that I can grow up to that new level, then I'm, I'm content. And maybe every once in a while God might dump an ocean in our path as well. But you're going to need to launch out in faith and be involved in more than you, you look at yourself and say, I could never do that. Don't say that. It's the worst thing you can say. Don't ever say never. Never say never. I can. With God's help, I can. Be faithful. Years ago, I flew in a small plane from Springfield, Missouri to Akron, Ohio. I knew something was wrong when we got in the plane the, Pilot just turned on, the, turned on the key, started the motors, taxied down the runway, and took off. I said to myself, what's missing? What's missing here? Checklist. Check. He didn't go through a checklist. We're up in the air. He didn't, how does he know everything's working? We flew for a few hours, and after a few hours, we were about 10,000 feet high, and I'm looking down, and I see this big airport down below us. I thought, hmm, I didn't know Akron had an airport this big. It was about time we were supposed to get to Akron. There were planes down, big, giant airplanes on the runway, and I looked out the window, and there was a big airplane just a... a few hundred yards that way, and there's another through the other window. And all at that time, uh, suddenly the air controller uh, came on through the radio uh, to the pilot and said some words which I won't repeat in this audience. <laughs> and what had happened is the pilot of that small plane had managed on the way to Akron. Now, if you've got to know geography, Springfield, Missouri to Akron, he had managed to stray over the municipal airport in Cincinnati, Ohio. He'd gotten way off course. And we were 10,000 feet over the major airport, and airliners were coming in, and, and they were getting on, talking to him, what's this plane doing in this airspace, and really let him have it. And it just, to me, epitomized the fact that he never started out the thing with a checklist, so naturally he was careless about navigation as well, and got off course. I found out a few months later after that flight that he had crashed. Fortunately, he wasn't hurt, but it may have been a good lesson for him. <laughs> but, there, you know, the eight steps I've gone through are a checklist. No, we, we look at them and we say, am, am I walking in these eight steps? I would almost suggest that to the degree you're not, to that degree you're weak in your Christian life. You look at these eight and say, wow, only one. 
I'd say you're at a real level of spiritual weakness. You look at all eight and say, man, I'm, I'm trucking along. I'm all, all eight. Say you're, you're coming along in real spiritual strength. These are kind of barometers, guidelines. They keep you navigationally on course. And I want to encourage you, if you're a new Christian, to walk in these steps. And if you're an older Christian and maybe you've gotten careless in these disciplines, to walk right back into them and begin practicing them. That's what we're doing in this series of things that are new. Refinding our roots, redefining our patterns, growing anew in the Lord. Behold, I make all things new. Be new. Grow in Christ. Walk with Him. Amen? Amen. We're here to have communion today at the close of the service. This is a wonderful time at the first Sunday of every month where we have a chance just to meet in a personal way of worship and prayer before the Lord. I always believe that when we're in a communion service, the healing presence of the Lord is, is here. He's here to heal inner needs, and He's heal, here to heal outer needs as well. And I'd like for us, as we worship the Lord and the serving of communion today, to open our hearts to the healing presence of Jesus, to reach out and touch Him, and to worship Him and adore Him. I'm going to ask the brothers and sisters that are helping us serve communion today to join me at the front at this time. And we'll